Welcome to the Echo Cast. This is yet another special episode. I was able to talk to Kate Hartfield today, who just uh, put out the book um, uh, Assassin's Creed: The Magus Conspiracy. Uh, we talked about all kinds of stuff, how she got into writing, uh, a lot about her process, um, her own love of games, uh, writing the book, and kind of what she may want to do uh, now uh, after the book has come out. So. Uh, Please check it out. Listen, uh, it's a great chat. She was very lovely, and uh, I will see you afterwards. Well, then, uh, Kate Hartfield, uh, thank you very much for joining me today. Um, I uh, have you on primarily because you have a new book called uh, Assassin's Creed, The Magus Conspiracy. Um, I guess the first thing I want to jump into is, uh, I guess, maybe something that you're asked every time, but uh, what led you to to this? Uh, how did your career start in writing, and what kind of led you to uh, Assassin's Creed? Yeah, absolutely. I'm super happy to be here. Uh, I uh, am a writer of historical fantasy and um, time travel books and various things, but uh, and short stories. And I've also written interactive fiction before for choice of games, and I've done a little bit of video game work as well. So I've written quite a lot before in historical settings. And so uh, when an email landed one day from my agent saying that uh, she knew that Aconite Books was looking for some pitches, uh, she couldn't tell me what, but it was a, it was like a historical property. And I had a, I had a sort of a, a suspicion. <laughs> and, that may or may uh, not know, involve assassins. Yeah, exactly, uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was not sure. quite that overt, but it was kind of like, hmm. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. yeah, so I, uh, I immediately, you know, um, sent some pitches and and started talking to Aconite about, uh, about the book idea. And uh, yeah, it's um, so I come to it from a, that's kind of my writing background. I have a, a big historical fantasy novel called the embroidered book that came out this spring as well. So I do write my own properties as well. Um, but I've, and I've also long been a, a gamer and uh, everyone in my house plays Assassin's Creed games. Uh, so it felt like a really natural fit. That's awesome. Um, I when I was doing a little research, I saw that you've not just written about games and historic. You've you've written about all kinds of stuff and uh, mm-hmm. you know political stuff and and everything. So um, I'm kind of curious um, what in general, and I think I know the answer. But what is what's your favorite subject to write about, or that you've written about maybe in the past, um, and 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 why? I guess. Yeah, I don't know if I have a single subject, but I I do I really do love. Um making up stories in historical settings that seems to be what draws me the most i keep coming back to it especially in long form you know like when i'm working on short essays or short stories i'll kind of bounce around and experiment and do different things um but historical fiction seems to be my first love and it's the, all the book length ideas that i get come in historical settings for me sure um mm-hmm. they're uh <laughs> I, I, I just I've kind of wondered. So you said I know and I saw in your um, uh, your history and what you've done, you've written for a couple games. And I guess what uh, to you, what's the big like creative difference uh, between writing for a specific game that's trying to tell like an interactive story and, and getting to write your own book and, and kind of going down that road? Yeah, um there's a few different things. I mean, I think the way that the player interacts with it obviously is uh, is key. That's a big uh, big part of the difference between writing interactive work and writing um, prose. And then, of course, there's also the distinction between writing something that's entirely your own and writing something that's collaborative and part of a team. Um, and uh, this book, The Megas Conspiracy, um, is a little bit of both because even though you know I was the one sitting in my desk uh, writing it every day, um, there's very much an awareness of um, the fact that you have this entire universe and, uh, you know, I had Ubisoft and, and Aconite working with me. And even though they weren't breathing down my neck at all, uh, I still I still sort of felt their presence, you know. Uh, so um, so that's a little bit different than when I'm working on my own stuff and I can kind of just um, shut everyone else out. You know, I think Stephen King has this uh, line in his book on writing about how the first draft should be written with the door closed uh, in a metaphorical sense. So you sort of keep the world out. Um, and that's a little bit harder to do when you're writing uh, for a property like Assassin's Creed. Um, although I think, you know, psychologically, you can still do it a little bit. 
Sure. It's, mm -hmm. uh, I, I, and one of my questions, which I'll kind of jump into uh, in, a, in a minute is about that. But one, one thing I've noticed a lot with you and, and some of the other people who have been putting out some of these books with Ubisoft is um, doing a lot of your own kind of footwork with um, getting it out there, um, getting in, uh, talking to fans and stuff like that. So um, do you feel like, cause you've been writing for a little while mm -hmm. and what, how do you think that role has changed for writers and kind of that hands-on uh, almost boots on the ground uh, advertising and, and like what responsibility do you feel like uh, maybe writers have now that they didn't, you know, 15, 20 years ago? Yeah, definitely a lot. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's a big part of the job. Um, and you know there are still writers who who manage to kind of uh, be recluses and and not be in social media and not talk to anybody. And, um, that can work, I think, uh, especially because nobody really knows how much of a difference it makes. It's really hard to kind of get a sense of, um, you know, does it make a difference to sales and and uh, to getting the word out. But I think just um, by instinct, I can say that having talked to people and having talked to fans and and uh, interacting with people. Um, you know, I can, I can see in my daily life that it does make some difference that I'm able to reach people and talk to people I wouldn't have otherwise. Uh, and I actually enjoy doing it for the most part. You know, I enjoy talking about books and I enjoy talking about games. Um, so it's not really a hardship for me, although obviously it's something that you have to factor into your time and energy sure. and, and everything else. Um, so it does seem to be, um, you know, if, if an author's, uh, willing to do, uh, that kind of thing to do interviews and to write guest posts and all the rest of it then um, the PR people at publishers are very happy to to work with that. Um, You're helping so. them out. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. The um, and I have to imagine in a way it's very gratifying too. to it, it's a very, you know, uh, on one hand, maybe you do or don't get to see the sales and, and all that stuff on one side, but that's very so disconnected. I have to imagine that when someone tags you on Twitter or, or, you know, something like that and, and you get that direct feedback that has to be really gratifying. And that's something that maybe you used to get at like book signings or things like that, where uh, you, you would get some of that interaction, but now it's for better or worse instant mm -hmm. and everywhere. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. And that it, it does make a huge difference, especially when you're kind of, you know, in the middle of a draft on something and you think, you know, does this matter? You know, why am I doing this? And then you get just like a little tweet or something from someone who says, you know, your book really made a difference to me and, it, you know, it, it made my day or whatever it is. And yeah, that really does help to keep you going. And uh, especially with this book, um, with having done my like this was my first book for uh, as a tie in to another property. And I wasn't sure about that like relationship with fandom. I wasn't sure how that was going to be, you know, and, and would people welcome it or would people sort of be like, ah, you know, I don't want you playing in my sandbox. And, and in sure. fact, you know, the fans have been, and the gamers of all kinds have been just absolutely fantastic and welcoming and um, enthusiastic to, to get to read the book. And um, so that's been really nice uh, to be able to, you know, talk to fans of the games. And, um, and, and even though, like, even though I was a gamer myself, I just wasn't mm -hmm. sure how that relationship would be. So that was really good. I think Assassin's Creed is kind of a unique property too, where uh, on one hand, it's it can be kind of a tough thing to get into because there's so many games, um, whether mm -hmm. it's like big giant experiences or even like mobile experiences and stuff. So they've told so many stories. So to to dive into that in one way um, can be scary because there's so much established. On the other hand, it's obviously a fan base that just desires story. So mm -hmm. I guess there's kind of that balance. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it was like it's very intimidating at first because there's so much and, you know, you want to kind of get a sense of, you know, you don't want to walk on anybody's toes or mess anything up for anyone. And but I knew that I had, you know, I had people at Ubisoft who would read my manuscript and make sure I didn't do that. But all the same, you know, um, people can be very protective of of their favorite characters and, and stories and that kind of thing. And and understandably so. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was intimidating at first, but but yeah, there is also this definitely this eagerness and this interest in history and this interest in in character, I think that is such a big part of the games for sure. So you 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 already kind of answered my next question of whether or not you play games yourself. Mm -hmm. Um so now I can dive right into um other than Assassin's Creed, uh, what what have been some of your favorite games, or are there any uh, like stories that you're really interested in yourself, either right now or in your past? 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, so I go back, um, I'm 45, so I got my my first game, I think, was probably Frogger on the uh, Commodore 64 in around 1983. Sure. <laughs> so, yeah, so so back to that, and uh, um, yeah, and I sort of, I've gone through phases in my life, you know, as I think many of us do, that you have an obsession for a little while, and then you sort of have to cut yourself off from that and, and get some work done. And, you come back to it. Sure. So I had, you know, I had my Diablo years. And um, I think, interestingly, for me, one of the games that I've come back to my entire life is like Civilization is um, sort of my comfort cup of tea. I think if I'm having a bad day or something, you put a game of Civilization on and, um, you know, that's sort of been there through all of the permutations of that game. Um, right now, um, a recent game I played was uh, Heaven's Vault that came out from Inkle a few years ago, okay. which is a really cool game about um, one of the things you have to do in that game is translate alien language. And that was so it was so unique. And I just thought it was a really fun use of interactivity in that game. So, uh, yeah, so I do try to play, um, you know, a few newer games and some also some sort of, you know, comfort things like uh, like Civ 6 or, or whatever. And uh i've played most of i've played or i've watched my partner and kid play uh most of the assassin's creed games and at the moment i'm kind of working my way through assassin's creed 2. okay great which is i think by a lot of assassin's creed fans accounts like the best probably the games have evolved much yeah. as you said like your own you know taste have and stuff like that yeah um i guess for yourself as someone who who makes stories and, and writes and does stuff like that do you find yourself um I guess I have two parts to this question. Do you do you find yourself leaning towards more narrative games because of that? Or I guess I could see you also lean away from it because maybe you just want to have your Sims game or yeah. you know your civilization and just be able to kind of not worry about that. Uh, so how, how do you feel like your own kind of career impacts the games that you've enjoyed? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. I've never really thought about it. Um, and I think that's... Uh, I think I do kind of interact with them a little bit differently. Like if it's a strategy game, like Evil Genius or or Civ Six or something like that, then I do feel like it's almost like um, a rest for my brain in a little way. Like there's there's not that big narrative and and it's it's uh, it's engaging, but you can also kind of just relax. I think and so I like that and um, and the same thing with like dungeon crawl games. And I mean I I also get um, I'm prone to motion sickness. So I'm a little bit uh, shy, sure. <laughs> like first person shooters and that kind of thing. So like I, I'm always a little bit nervous about them and I'll sort of try them out and see how they, how they do with my motion sickness. But actually these days they're getting a lot better in, in that regard. Um, so yeah, but narrative games, I tend to treat a little bit more like, um, like reading, like, uh, you know, I just kind of want to keep up with the field and see what cool things people are doing. And so it's less of a kind of relaxation mode and more, um, more engagement mode, I guess you could say. Well, and, and like that it itself has probably become kind of difficult because I feel like, you know, story games, um, I fairly recently got really into the Mass Effect series. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure from like a writer's point of view like that, that game's either a nightmare or like amazing to play because either you uh, look at it from a professional standpoint or you just enjoy the story. But games mm -hmm. like that used to be somewhat linear, like you had some choice. Mm -hmm. Um, but you were going down the path, even in a game like that series or obviously lots of others. But nowadays, even story games are just so open and can mm -hmm. be so grand and so uh, almost I, I would say overwhelming uh, much of the mm -hmm. time. Um, and, and, you know, it used to be you could play a story game in eight to ten hours. And now, like uh, the most recent Assassin's Creed, the uh, um, Valhalla is kind of known for being a great game, but also for, you know, taking a solid 60 or 70 hours to just beat the base game, let mm -hmm. alone all these other great stories. So um, yeah. I, I, I think it's kind of an interesting change in that experience. Yeah, definitely. It's really it's really evolving quickly. And like the way that the gamers approach these games in their lives is changing, too, for sure. Um, so uh, as for uh, the Magus conspiracy, um, can you just give a obviously a non spoiler because you, you want people to, to read and listen to the book? Um, but can yeah. you give just like a really base summary of of kind of where it takes place and, and maybe some of the uh, some of the intrigue within it? Yeah, absolutely. So it's uh, actually I've got a copy here, so I'll hold it up for anyone who wants to see the video. That wonderful it's a very cover cool by Bastion cover. Jez. Yeah, it's very yeah. cool. He did a great job on it. Um, so it's it's set in the 1850s. So it's a little it's a little bit before the events of Syndicate for those who played Syndicate. Um, and 
it's uh, kind of all over Europe, and we have two main characters. One of them is um, an equestrian performer in the circus. Um, hi, Minerva. This is my cat. <laughs> um, and uh, her name is Pierrette, and she's she's a sort of teenager who performs on horseback in the circus in London. And the other character is um, Simeon Price, who is a British soldier. And uh, we meet him when he is on deck, the troop ship HMS Birkenhead, um, which is about to go down. Uh, so uh, uh, neither one of them are assassins uh, at the beginning of the book. Um, so they're sort of uh, newcomers to the Brotherhood and, and how they interact with, with uh, the Brotherhood of Assassins is uh, the plot of the game. And uh, the other sort of main character who... Um, is a presence in in the book, even though she's only there for the beginning of it. Is uh, Ada Love Ada Lovelace, who you know, sort of the foremother of computers, uh, who plays a big role in in oh, okay. setting the plot in motion. Um, and was there so? I, was this a um, I, I guess the general like uh, the time frame and and general story? Was that something presented to you, or was that like and that they asked you to expand on, or was that from your pitch completely? Yeah, it was mostly my pitch. So uh, they came to me saying they wanted something in the latter half of the 19th century, um, which was cool because uh, I had not written fiction in the 19th century before, even though I read a lot about it and felt quite comfortable with it. So I knew that I was looking at the second half of the 19th century in Europe. And um, my editors at Aconite had um, an interest in the fact that there was a, there were a lot of assassinations during that time period, like political assassinations were were um, quite common, and uh, you know, like Queen Victoria had eight attempts on her life, and um, there were bombings and uh, new weapons and and stabbings, and and then it, you know these actually changed politics quite a lot during that period, and you had the rise of anarchism and um, and communism, of course, and so a lot of sort of political ferment, which I love, and uh, you know, interesting historical events that could possibly be worked into it. So the big question I think for us was, um, you know, how would these assassinations fit into the story of Assassin's Creed? You know, who's behind them and, and why? And um, So that was sort of a natural jumping off point. Uh, but the actual story and the characters, uh, that was all me. So they said, you know, can, can you come up with a story that would fit into that setting and explore some of those themes? Uh, so I did, and we went back and forth with a couple of different outlines and, um, you know, for the most part, it was it was uh, sort of my ideas and just checking to make sure that it it didn't break anything and everything was going to be okay. And so I felt very supportive in that creative process, or supported that there was um, a sense very much of okay, you're the writer, you go do your thing, and we'll let you know if there's any uh, issues that you need to be aware of. Did you find anything um, since you hadn't written kind of in that time frame before? Did you find anything particularly challenging or like particularly interesting during your research and kind of getting into that? It sounds like you said like there's a lot of assassinations and the world was changing technologically, especially unfortunately military wise and weapon wise. Mm -hmm. Was there anything particular yeah. about that time that uh, kind of stood out to you? Yeah, I think that was uh, a big part of it for the research because. Um, like that that change, that rapid change, because the book starts in the early 1850s and it moves into the early 1860s. It covers, I think, about 12 years. And uh, even just things like uh, like railroads, you know, in the 1850s versus the 1860s, there's a huge difference in how much of Europe was covered, connected by railways. And um, of course, fashion, you know, fashion changes so quickly. So remembering, you know, oh, no, that's not the silhouette of, of <laughs> that I want. That was three years ago. So because the book actually covers quite a, a span of history, um, that was a challenge, always making sure that I was not using the research that I had used for three chapters before when things were different. Um, uh, and I love the research part of it. That's something that's always really fun for me. So um, I don't mind doing it, but that was uh, definitely a challenge, but it is, uh, it's a fun period of history in that there's a lot available. You know, you can go and, and find a lot of the, the primary sources that you need. Uh, it starts out, one of the early chapters is at the Great Exhibition in London. Uh, and there are a lot of, you know, firsthand accounts of what the Great Exhibition was like, and you can, you know, read the pamphlets and everything else. Uh, so that was uh, really fun for me because when I do earlier periods in history, often there's not as much to draw on. 
Yeah, well, and Assassin's Creed from the games and stuff as well is it, it, it's always done a good job of obviously being very set in the time frame it was set in, but it always allows itself a little bit of freedom to be like, yeah, but we also just randomly all have this technology before anyone else because we're the Brotherhood, and so I assume that kind of opens up a it gives you a little bit of uh, of leeway um, when yeah, it comes for to sure. yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a little, there's a little. Um, you know, science fiction, science fiction there. There. Yeah, yep. exactly. Where you can kind of say, okay, well, maybe nobody had this quite yet, but it is conceivable that, you know, somebody, somebody might have secretly had it a few years earlier or something like that. So that allowed me to play around a little bit. Were there any stories, like real stories from that time, whether it was assassinations or not, that uh, you kind of parlayed into your own book that because they were just so interesting, you had to? Um, or is there any like any specific events that really inspired you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was a few. Um, yeah, so, and some of them are assassinations, uh, you know, that are sort of the, the key points that I thought, okay, well, I want to hit this and this and this. And I kind of had those tent poles in my outline right from the beginning that I knew that those had to be in the book. Um, and some of them were um, just little stories that I thought were interesting, um, little pieces of technology. Um, one of the things that really inspired me early on as I was reading about Ada Lovelace was... Um, that she had all these cool ideas that we don't even we haven't even heard about now that that she wasn't just interested in the analytical engine which which uh, you know was sort of the forerunner of the computer she was interested in all kinds of science and she was uh corresponding with these scientists who were working on electricity and trying to create life out of nothing and and the music of the spheres and all kinds of stuff so it was a really exciting time that way where a lot of there's a lot of really cool early science happening at the same time as a lot of stuff that today looks to us like a little bit woo. <laughs> like, sure, you know? sure. Yeah, yeah. So there's a lot of that sort of, and of course, you know, uh, it doesn't feature in this book very much, but this was also a time when there was a lot of um, like spiritualism and mysticism and that kind of thing happening at the same time. Um, so all of that uh, I found really interesting. And uh, just some of the characters too, like the sort of, um, side characters uh i guess that we haven't heard a lot about um since uh that i tried to to work in where i could without overwhelming the story so um you know there were a few sort of interesting people who i won't spoil but um yeah. but they do come in eventually the so you said this was kind of the first time you had written something that was like a part of an existing story or franchise or something like that what kind of lessons do you feel like you learned in the process of writing this that you know i'm sure you wouldn't mind doing something like this again mm -hmm. um but compared to your previous works of you know, what would you say you learned from this um that will maybe change your process in the future yeah um probably a lot uh so I'm thinking about it right now because um, it's it's now public knowledge that I'm writing the sequel to this uh, for Aquanine Books. So it's going to be called The right. Resurrection Plot. Yeah. So book two, uh, there's a planned trilogy, but I'm only contracted so far to write the second book, which is called The Resurrection Plot. And so I'm writing that now. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I think with tie-in work, it tends to be tighter deadlines than, um, uh, than other kinds of publishing. So, you know, I've got a pretty pretty tight deadline to work with um and having to have the outline approved uh, in some detail beforehand also is a little bit different from other kinds of publishing um but that's also like those two things fit together so you know it's sure. the approved outline that allows me to write quickly enough to meet the deadline um so that's been a really valuable lesson for me i think for all kinds of writing is um the more work i do up front uh the faster the rest of it's going to go and, you know, to a certain extent, I still think sometimes you have to allow yourself to play and go off on tangents and do things that are not going to end up in the final book. Um, you know, you can't just be efficient, 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 you know, because then it's not art, you know. It's not yeah, fun. you have to have a little fun. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. But at the same time, you know, working in this collaborative process with a deadline that um, all of that is also a really good way to kind of learn those skills and to say, OK, well, I have a feeling this is going to pay off, but I know this is not. And, and this is not a good use of my time or whatever it is. Um, so that's a skill that I think I'll keep with me. Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. And I guess um, from so I have a little bit of experience um, with someone who wrote uh, two books for The Division and, and speaking um, with them a little bit, doing like a text interview with them. Um, and 
I, I guess the his experience was uh, was working pretty closely with people from the division, um, like the narrative mm-hmm. leads and stuff like that. I guess can you kind of talk about um, what kind of interaction you had directly with people from Ubisoft or people directly from the Assassin's Creed development team? Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, not a whole lot at first. It was um, very much Aconite Books and my editors at Aconite Books. Um, were the sort of go-betweens in a lot of ways um so they would work with me on the plot and and then once we had something that we were happy with we would go to ubisoft and uh then i would get comments back um you know just sort of saying ask you know asking questions like okay well how is this going to fit in over here or you know can you just clarify this part or whatever it was um so there was never a sort of you know big smackdown of like you know no don't do that (laughs) but always just sort of like you know poking things and making sure that that we had everything straight in our heads and um, you know, even just little things like character names and that kind of thing, like just making sure that um, everything made sense to them um, as well. <laughs> Excuse me. So um, so that was pretty much the extent of my interaction um, with them. And um, but the other part of it, I think, that was really useful, uh, which was not quite as direct, um, is just having access to all of the material that is out there already. So they did, you know, they sent me um you know sort of bible material to work with sure. you know to make sure, sure that i had everything mm-hmm. uh, all the lore um that i that i needed uh and also i just you know on my own because i am that kind of over researcher i also have just read a lot of the assassin's creed books and um you know um gone out to find a lot of the other media stories that they've created uh to just get a, a sense of what the whole universe can be like and and what um other writers are are doing in that universe uh, which helps me to kind of <clears throat> just get a sense for what an assassin's creed story feels like uh in in different media and uh and also it sort of gives me the ability to to pull in some of those threads too and leave some easter eggs for readers who've read some other thing or will, will sure. recognize it you know that's always fun too a little bit of crossover yeah um what, what were when you were doing that research and looking into the, the you know the Lord Bible and all of that? Were there any particular stories um, that have already been told that really jumped out to you, um, or anything that kind of really got you going on your own storytelling? Hmm. Um. I don't think so. I think it there's really, a lot. It, yeah, there's a lot. <laughs> there's a lot for sure. And I think you know uh, one of the things that. Um, you know, I, th- I think was uh, an interesting decision right off the bat for us was, you know, how much of the sort of precursor um, mythology, you know, for those who know Assassin's Creed, there's like this whole backstory of of human civilization, um, which comes into it. And it could be quite, you know, it's really fascinating. And I think it could be quite overwhelming. Um, so how we drew on that, I thought, was um was something we kind of had to decide right off the bat. And, and we were very interested in, in making this kind of a self-contained story. And there, there is talk of the precursors in it, but um, um, this particular book is, you know, there's not a lot of that in it. It's, it's mostly historical fiction and not a lot of the sort of science fiction or alternate history that you can find in Assassin's Creed. So that was, there was that question, I think, right off the bat. Um, but I do find all that stuff really, really fascinating. So there was a temptation to go down that rabbit hole, I think. Um, but the other thing that really was helpful for me is that I really loved Syndicate and I had played Syndicate all the way through when I started the okay. book. And, you know, even though there's not a lot of crossover because the time doesn't quite line up and also because we didn't want this to be like the novelization of Syndicate, that's a different thing. Sure. Um, so, you know, there's not a whole lot of crossover in the book, but um, getting a sense for what an Assassin's Creed story set in the 19th century felt like um, and having a sense for some of the characters and that kind of thing, that was really helpful. Yeah, it's definitely the the whole franchise has taken kind of an interesting, I don't want to say a turn, but it's definitely gone down such a different path of, you know, the first couple of games were so, you know, like the 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 Templars and the Brotherhood were pretty clearly set or at least, you know, they were set in reality in a lot of mm-hmm. ways. And now with Odyssey and Valhalla, they've basically been like, OK, 
but Atlantis. Like, you know, they, <laughs> yeah. they've been like, OK, but Minotaurs like, yeah. you know, so and, and, and I think that from a creative point of view, I, I know some people like that and some people don't. Some people appreciate the more the older, more kind of based um, in reality stories and stuff like that. But, you know, you can only take that so far. And I think even for someone like yourself or for the people writing upcoming games and stuff, um, bringing in some of the, like you said, alternate history or completely fantastic history. Um, it, I don't know. Maybe it makes it a little more interesting. Um, mm -hmm. it, it opens up so many more possibilities because not only science fiction, but like fantasy almost to mm -hmm. a point. Yeah. Yeah, it really is. It's sort of like, you know, science fiction that's indistinguishable from from magic for sure. Um, so and I'm really, you know, since I tend to be a speculative fiction writer anyway, I'm really comfortable with that side of it. Um, so, yeah, I think there's uh, there's a lot of scope there. And I think, you know, sometimes a lot of the challenge is just sort of narrowing it down and saying, OK, well, what what is this book going to be about? Um, because, yeah, like you said earlier on, there's so many stories and so many possibilities in this universe. Are there any, um, obviously, you know, uh, you're writing a sequel for this book, which is incredible. Mm -hmm. Are there any other uh, game franchises from your own playing history or just from your knowledge that would be kind of like, oh, wow, yeah, I definitely want to do that, as it sounds like Assassin's Creed kind of was. Is, are mm -hmm. there any, any other franchises off the top of your head that you can think of that would be exciting to write for? Hmm. Um... There's nothing that's really jumping out at me. Uh, something that would be fun, I, I did, I mentioned Evil Genius a little while ago, and mm -hmm. I, I actually did some uh, work for uh, the game Evil Genius 2 for Rebellion, um, which came out, um, what is time these days? A year or two, <laughs> yeah. two years ago, something like that, mm -hmm. <laughs> sometime recently. Um, so uh, yeah, so I just wrote some some dialogue and that kind of thing for that game, which was lots of fun. Um, uh, but I also, and I wrote a comic that uh, went along with it, like accompanied it for the for the magazine. And so that was really fun having written two different formats for the same property. Sure. Um, so, you know, I think it would be fun to explore even more of that and to write, you know, novels or something set in that world. Um, and that's a totally different kind of um, aesthetic uh, than I normally write to because it's sort of uh, humorous and science fictional and, and that kind of thing. So that would be fun. Um, yeah, I think uh, I'm trying to think if there's any other games that I really there's nothing that's really jumping out at me. But um, yeah, I think I think it's neat that there's there's sort of scope for storytelling, even in, you know, we started out talking about how some, you know, some games have that story and some games not so much. Um, it's neat how you can find it in the crocs, you know, of almost any game, I think. And um, so that would be a fun challenge. Yeah, I I think it's it's kind of interesting too because I I obviously there's been books written about video game stories for a long time, but I really mm -hmm. feel like it, there has been, and, and I'm kind of curious on your take of it. Do you feel like there's been like a turn in in this in the um, maybe the seriousness of it of maybe at one point it used to just be and eh, we just need to put a book out with this game for mm -hmm. advertising purposes where now it feels like it's taken really seriously like like mm -hmm. your book and um i know that there was mm -hmm. recently the the same publisher um did like a division book and i think they're doing all mm -hmm. kinds of books um with all yeah. kinds of games and it's not like uh like a sideshow like maybe it was at one point it's it's a serious thing it's it's something yeah. that you know, and, and people really enjoy it yeah, definitely. And I think that that's, that's true across the board when it comes to tie-in writing as well. You know, like I think there used to be a real stigma for writers who did their own work, uh, you know, if, if they then wrote um, other novels. Uh, and it's always been the case that, that fantastic writers have done tie-in novels. You know, I know uh, sure. John M. Ford wrote Star Trek novels and award-winning <laughs> novels in his own right. Um, you know, so it's always been the case that writers were quite happy to play in any universe, but there is this weird stigma about it. And um, I think that that is reduced somewhat now. And um, especially, I think, with with properties like uh, Star Wars and Marvel, um, really using um, writers from all walks of life to say, yes, come and play in this universe. And I think that that helps a lot for sure. Well, they've kind of mainstreamed uh, comics and video games and it's it's and even yeah. video games in general, like a, even a property like Assassin's Creed. When it first came out, it was, you know, video games were video games that kids played and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, and as well as like, I'm, I'm 34. And so I've played games my entire life. And so mm -hmm. like the generation, but, you know, before us, you know, games became a thing when they were already adults. 
you know yeah. and and i i feel like there's just a i think part of you know things like this being taken more seriously and becoming so good is because you know it's they're like movies to us you know they, mm-hmm. they're, they're things that have always been around and we've always taken them seriously there's there's pixel games from the 80s and 90s that i you know cared about the stories in, and, and mm-hmm. you know and, and i think that's kind of a unique experience mm-hmm. yeah for sure and and you know one of the things that really struck me as I was working on this book is that it wasn't really different from writing other books. You know, like once I had the basic parameters of the story and I knew the universe and everything else, you know, I just went off and wrote it the way I would write anything else. And, you know, the prose was the same as I would write anywhere else and and everything else and character and and theme. And, um, you know, so it was, uh, yeah, I, I definitely felt that and I felt that that was welcomed too by Ubisoft and by Aconite is that they definitely wanted my skills as a writer and they wanted me to tell the story in this universe. So um, there was never any sense of, you know, oh, you've got to, you've got to sort of put your own creativity aside and just write what we want. Um, it was very much a collaboration, I think. It, it wasn't a, uh, an AI bot making a exactly. story that you were just playing like Mad Libs with and putting in yeah. the right words to make it sound like a person wrote it. Sure. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I didn't feel like sort of, you know, hacky work for a paycheck or, or whatever people might, might wonder sure. about, you know, whether that's what it is. And it didn't feel like that at all. Well, and even within gaming, there's kind of this thing where these smaller studios will take on uh, – contracted projects literally just to get enough money to make their own game and and i think that's maybe how writing for games and stuff like that used to be where it's like uh, okay i'll pump out this thing just so i can mm-hmm. get enough money to make this thing i actually care about but it doesn't seem like that has to happen anymore now it seems like you can have both um yeah which is nice yeah yeah exactly and it's just sort of a, a bigger universe for everybody and you know and not every player is going to want to read book set in the game universe sure. and you know and uh, and i don't know how much uh, is is true vice versa but i i definitely wrote this book explicitly so that somebody who's never played assassin's creed could understand it and maybe this is their entry into the universe so that would be great sure. too if that happens well and there's so much of a I, I don't think people realize now that um and it's kind of like what we were talking about just before of you know games are taken so much more seriously now uh i, I think it always takes people uh, like my own my wife i remember showing her at one point um that video games like just absolutely topple like movie revenue now and people mm-hmm. don't think about it they and now i think it also does count mobile games which are just a wild whole separate set of things um mm-hmm. but they're starting to like tell stories and stuff too they aren't just bejeweled you know mm-hmm. um so i guess kind of my my final thing i'll ask you um now that the book has been out for a little bit um mm-hmm. you said it was the first kind of property you were writing for like from like an existing thing do you um are you happy with how the reception has been are you happy with um do you feel like you integrated your your own story into that franchise really well mm-hmm. yeah absolutely I've, I've been super happy with how it's been received and um yeah the uh, the reviews have been really great and uh you know i've 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 heard now from readers from both sides of you know readers who picked it up because they had liked my own work and were not familiar with assassin's creed and they liked the book and i've also heard from assassin's creed readers who had no idea who i was and and they liked the book as well um you know and of course no book is going to please everybody so that's you know it, <laughs> i'm not expecting everyone's going to love it but um sure. it's nice to see that people can come to it from uh, from different places and still find something in the book uh, to enjoy. So that's been really gratifying to see. And um, yeah, yeah, I've been really happy with how, uh, you know, Aconite and Ubisoft have both really supported it being out there. And um, as you said, you know, I've been doing a lot of, uh, you know, sort of promo stuff and guest posts and um, they've been really helpful, you know, supporting that and, and finding um, opportunities for me to talk about the book and stuff too, which is really great. Um so yeah, it's 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 felt really positive and uh, and it's a great way to go into writing that sequel because you know you have a sense that people are are going to be interested in it and um, that it's gonna you know make some people happy who who like the first one. So yeah, that's it's a good place to be. And, uh, yeah, and everyone will hear a little muse. That's Minerva. Oh, my that's, cat. that's fine. So <laughs> do you, so the wheels are. So I assume you're. Um, is there an, already an expected date for the next book or? All right, what's what's kind of the story on that right now? Yeah, yeah. So I'm writing the the draft of it now. So it's um, 
yeah, I'm sort of right in the thick of it uh, at the moment and uh, behind on my deadline, as is uh, as is always the way. As is life. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's exactly. okay. The video we'll game about. world completely understands delays and everything, <laughs> yeah, especially yeah, over the last couple of years. Yeah, it's happened once or twice. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, I mean, hopefully, I, I think everything will be fine by the time I actually hit my deadline. But um, at the moment, I've got to catch up. Um, so, yeah, so I'm I'm working on the draft of that book now. Um, I haven't seen the cover yet, but um, I have seen the brief for the cover. So um, oh, okay. I expect that the cover will be coming out uh, fairly soon and Aconite Books will um, we'll let people know when that's, when that's out. Um, so, and I think, I don't think there's a firm publication date yet, but I know the plan is, um, roughly the same time next year. So this, okay. the first one came out in August, 2022. And I think the second one's coming out in July or August, 2023. Um, so I think that's the plan. And then, um, we do have a sort of basic idea for, for, uh, making it a trilogy. So there would be another book the following year, if everything kind of goes, uh, according to plan so we'll see great well i wish you luck with that um before i ask you too many questions and and break any ndas that may be happening i uh, i'll start to wrap things up here um exactly. if people want to uh people want to buy the book where should they go where, where's the best place for them to check it out yeah so um it, pretty much any bookstore uh, can either have it or you can order it there um so anywhere you like to buy books is great uh, there's a wonderful audiobook that's narrated by Moira Quirk um and it's available from recorded books um at all of the usual digital audiobook download places so any of your apps um that have audiobooks um it's available in Kindle and in paperback. Um, the one place it's not out yet is the UK paperback is not out yet. It's coming out in October. Um, but everywhere else, you should be able to find it um, in, in whatever format you like and, uh, you know, request it from your local library. Um, yeah, and to find sort of buy links and more information about it and that kind of thing, if you go to Aconite Books, and that's A-C-O-N y-t-e books uh they have a page uh for the megas conspiracy there and it'll have information and, and links and all that good stuff uh one question before i i know i was kind of wrapping things up but the yeah. audiobook what's that pro are you involved in that process at all or is that kind of something done completely outside of you yeah it's it's not there's not a whole lot of involvement um you know i've had different books uh be produced as audiobooks now and sometimes you'll get a sort of um, a chance to weigh in on the narrator or things like that you'll get asked about pronunciation for things and okay. um yeah this one i didn't have a whole lot of involvement with but i'm super happy with how it turned out and um yeah she's a great uh, a great narrator for the book um so yeah it's um yeah, typically there's not there's not a whole lot of involvement with with the author unless there's something that they need to know. Like they, sure. they're like, OK, all of this, you know, in uh, in my fantasy novel, the embroidered book, um, I had these large sections of weird spell casting and Latin and stuff like that. And I felt so bad for my narrator of like, oh, so, you know, next time I'll think about that in advance. <laughs> sure. That, that was my bonus question. So yeah. um, if people want to follow you and kind of what you have going on on social media or elsewhere, where should they find you? Um, so I'm pretty easy to find uh, on Twitter, Instagram. I'm Kate Hartfield, and that's uh, just my name, which is K-A-T-E-H-E-A-R-T-F-I-E-L-D. Um, I'm also on TikTok, although very seldom, but uh, trying to get on there more. And, uh, you know, Facebook, you can find me. I have an author page on Facebook as well. Uh, and my website is just katehartfield.com, and I'll have information there about all my books as well. OK, well, I ask anyone who listened to this and, and got here to the end to check all those things out and to please check out the book uh, in whatever platform you prefer. Uh, Kate, thank you so much for being on with me today. Uh, it was thank really, you. really nice talking to you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, likewise. Great. Thank you. Thank you. OK, well, there was our chat. I hope you enjoyed it. I really enjoyed chatting with her. Um, a lot of interesting insight about writing and stuff. I've really enjoyed this series because I've been talking to people who do what I do, but do it differently or don't do what I do at all and do like way cooler stuff. And so to get to learn more about that is really interesting to me. Um, and I hope it is to you as well. I, um, I really hope you've been enjoying these interviews I've been doing. Um, I really enjoy them. They've really kind of reinvigorated my uh, enjoyment of doing the podcast and all that. So there's more coming. I've already got a few people that were are definite yeses. Uh, I've got a maybe that is really exciting. Uh, we'll see when that comes around. Um, but yeah, so 
you know, that, that's why I have this time. Make sure to subscribe to the podcast if you're listening to it. Make sure to subscribe to the YouTube if you're watching. Uh, you know, like the videos, do the comments and all that stuff. Check me out on Twitter at Bond Diesel and at the Echo Cast. And uh, that's where we're going to wrap this one up. So until next time. I'm going to go